I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Lloyd Sumner uh, is with the Metabolomics Center here at the University of Missouri. He's uh, recently joined uh, the university uh, not, not more than a year ago or so, or about a year ago, and so we're very excited to have him today as a speaker. It's a very exciting area of work. Um, okay, I think, uh, yes, the presentation is queued up, so please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Lloyd Sumner. Good morning, everybody, um, or good afternoon. <laughs> so, uh, it's good to be here uh, to talk with you about our work and uh, our shared interest uh, in uh, trees and uh, agroforestry-based products and medicinal plants and the natural products that go with them. So today, uh, I want to talk with you about a new center that we've uh, started here called the Metabolomic Center and kind of share with you how we're using this to understand pecan. So the research focus of my group is the development of large-scale biochemical profiling tools that allow us to profile hundreds to thousands of metabolites. And this really is a great biochemical phenotype of what's going on in the plant and helps us understand what's going on in the plant. And we're actually using this technology to study many different things, um, um, mainly focused around plant natural products. And so these are very important to many of the themes that we've discussed today. These are often called specialized metabolites. And so our for former speaker just talked about glucosinolates. These are one class of natural products. Our specialized metabolites, uh, we've talked about uh, ginseng, which has ginsenicides, which are terpenoids that are important uh, to medicinal properties. Uh, and, and the list just goes on. And so. Really, uh, we're developing technology to understand plant biochemistry, and this is really focused on plant natural products uh, biochemistry. And so today, I want to talk with you a little bit about the technology and a little bit about the, the biology. Uh, so let's start real quickly with the biology. And so let's see here. It's moving here, but it's not moving there. There we go, okay. So the, the biological story I wanna talk with you about today is, uh, is pecan scab. And uh, I come from Oklahoma prior to coming here. Uh, I came about a year ago, and pecan scab is a very important pathogen in the southeast and, and in Oklahoma. Uh, this is a fungal pathogen. Uh, it has and causes severe uh, yield loss as well as uh, severe uh, uh, problems with nut quality. And what you can actually see is a progressive uh, a demonstration of this fungal pathogen on the nut and the, the associated nut quality decline that we see with that as well. So this is a fungal pathogen and we want to understand what's going on. So those of you that are in the pecan industry or tree nut industry know that we often treat these fungal pathogens and other pathogens via spraying. Uh, this is often done on a regular basis uh, and or through some type of scouting uh, mechanism followed by the spray once you see pathogens. And so, but this is a very expensive option and it's very actually a complex mechanical process of doing that as well. So we actually know that there is some genetic resistance to this fungal pathogen. And we know specifically there are a couple of varieties of interest to us specifically Kanza, uh, which I saw out in the lobby with one of our vendors, vendors, and then there's a Pawnee variety. And these have differential susceptibility to this fungal pathogen. And so we wanted to know why, why that difference is there. Is there a phytochemical or a natural products base to that? And can we understand that through the chemistry and then maybe ultimately exploit that? And so to do that, this really brings into a need for the technology. And that is the metabolomics or large-scale biochemical profiling of these metabolites to understand is there a phytochemical difference between these that might be responsible. And so recently I was recruited to the University of Missouri and we're starting a new metabolomics center. Uh, it's here in this building on the second floor. If anybody wants to come up and see our toys, uh, we're happy to have some show and tell during lunch uh, if you like. 
Uh, this is our, our organizational chart for our new metabolomic center. Uh, this is composed of uh, two parts. One is my research part uh, that uh, we focus in on natural products, and then we have a metabolomic center that makes this technology available to others, uh, others at the university, others in the region, industry, and, and throughout. And this is led by my colleague, Dr. Zintian Lei. Um, and uh, Zintian has uh, significant experience in plant uh, biochemistry. He actually has a PhD in wood uh, sciences from Virginia Tech. Uh, and he and I have been working together for the past 15 years, and he's got lots of experience in large-scale biochemical profiling of both proteins and metabolites. And the, with that, he has additional instrumental skills and a strong background in biochemistry. So we were very fortunate to, to recruit him to Missouri as well. And, and he's done most of the, the pecan work that I'm going to talk about today. So as part of this uh, uh, setting up this new center, uh, we bought some instrumental resources. Uh, we bought a GCMS, and with that, we, it was a buy one, get one free type of situation. So we got two GCMS, and then we had to buy another LCMS. So who, who knows what a mass spectrometer is? So... Maybe half. So these are just big fancy instruments that weigh molecules and help us understand their identity. And the gas chromatography and liquid chromatography are just ways we separate complex mixtures before doing that mass analysis. So the university has invested uh, approximately $750,000 in this instrumentation uh, that's going into the, uh, that's already in the uh, metabolomic center. With that, I, I brought with us some, a few more toys, about two and a half, three million dollars of other mass spectrometers and actually an NMR uh, spectrometer as well. And these are the necessary resources that we need to do this large-scale uh, biochemical profiling. And we've now been doing this for uh, 17, 18 years. And we're getting pretty good at it, and especially when it comes to plants. So when we talk about large-scale biochemical profiling, and or metabolomics. This is not a singular experiment. We, it's not like CSI where we walk across the hall, give it to somebody, and they come back with all the answers. It's actually a series of experiments that we do. And we have to do this series of experiments because the chemistry and the physical properties associated with those chemicals vary dramatically within all living organisms. And so some things are very uh, polar. These are ionic things such as salts, or metals, things like that. And then we have things that are intermediately polar, such as amino acids, organic acids, sugars, nucleotides. Does this make sense to some, most people? You've heard of these different types of molecules. Uh, these are the biochemical basis of life. And then we have another tool, uh, that the LCMS, that we use to uh, look at these things that are intermediately polar. These are many of the natural products that we're interested in. And then we have another uh, class of compounds, the waxes, the terpenes. These are very nonpolar. And so to really profile all of these, we actually do a series of experiments. And we use a series of solvents to extract these, and then we use, follow that up with parallel analyses on different type of instrumental platforms. And through this approach, again, we can profile hundreds to thousands of metabolites using this uh, metabolomics platform. And so this is our experimental workflow. We don't need much material. The, the equipment that we use is very sensitive. So typically we start with milligram levels of materials, uh, and we go through this different differential solvent extraction process. And this gives us three samples. It gives us a sample of the intermediate natural products that we're really interested in, and we profile those using liquid chromatography coupled to mass spectrometry. And then we get a two couple of fractions that come out of here that we analyze by gas chromatography, mass spectrometry. And so what do those look like? Well, this is what those uh, profiles look like. Essentially, what we do is we do complex mixture analysis. So we are separating them over time uh, and uh, uh, measuring the things that come out. And so if you count the number of peaks in each of those, there's easily the two to 300 components in each of those profiles that again, help us better understand what's going on biochemically, because the plant can't tell us, uh, so we're, we're, we're asking these questions. And so the, the composition of that data is that we are separating complex mixtures over time, and uh, two to 10 times a second, so very, at a fairly high frequency, we're weighing molecules that come out, and we get this, what's called a mass spectra. There's a current associated with that, we plot that over time. The area under this peak tells us how much is there, 
And this is kind of like a chemical fingerprint that tells us what it is. Now, we can't always tell what that is, but often if that, if that culprit's in our database, we can match those fingerprints and use that for chemical identification. So again, we separate compounds over time, and in that, we are collecting mass spectra behind that that tells us a little bit more about them. All right, so this is just kind of a hit list of the kinds of molecules that we see. For example, in our polar profiles, we see a large number of organic acids. We see a large number of amino acids, sugars, monosaccharides, disaccharides. Uh, we see other alcohols, uh, sugar alcohols, as well as traditional alcohols, amines, polyamines, and uh, nucleotides. And so this is, there won't be a test. Uh, this is a very complex slide. But the take-home message should be is that using this technology, we can see a broad coverage of metabolism. And so this is what's traditionally called primary metabolism, metabolism that's critical for life, OK? And then we'll talk more about specialized metabolism here in a minute. Sometimes molecules co-elute in the chromatography domain. We're not able to separate them. But again, we have that mass domain behind here. These compounds are unique. Therefore, they often will have unique molecular weights. We can weigh those, and then we can differentiate them. And again, what that does is it takes chromatograms that are often ugly and separates them into the individual components. So although we may be able to count two to 300 components in those profiles, using the mass domain in this deconvolution, we can actually differentiate four, five, 600 compounds in each of these profiles, okay? And so this is our metabolic fingerprint. This is our high resolution uh, biochemical method that we use to understand uh, what's going on. So now on to specialized metabolites. Um, so in gas chromatography, we use heat to separate molecules. And sometimes it's like my cooking. When we add too much heat, things decompose before they separate. And so in those cases, we have to use a different technology called liquid chromatography. And so this is actually what we use is ultra high pressure liquid chromatography, which is liquid chromatography on steroids, more or less. And so traditional HPLC is about 5,000 PSI pumps. These are 18,000 PSI pumps. And really, what that allows us to do is separate more molecules and to give us a, a higher definition in these biochemical fingerprints. And again, this technology is really much more focused to the natural products, the glucosinolates, the flavonoids, the isoflavonoids, the terpenoids, and many of these things that are important in plant defense. Now, plants use these chemicals to defend themselves, but we as humans have co-opted those for nutraceutical and pharmacological activity as well. So like there was a list of compounds that we can identify in the GCMS mode, we also have a, a hit list here, very busy, but it's composed of those things that we just talked about. These natural products, glucosinolates, terpenoids, flavonoids, isoflavonoids, and many of these things are conjugated, conjugated with sugars and other things. So. so that's our technology platform. And so we've been applying that to pecan. So we go back to our study on pecan and we say, is there a phytochemical difference between these resistant varieties and these susceptible varieties? And the answer to that is, is absolutely yes. And you can look at these two representative profiles and you can see that very easily. There are some peaks uh, that are there. And but because these data sets are so complex, we often turn to statistical tools as well. And so we can ask this qu simple qu question, are they different from this, uh, what's called a PCA score? And, and the answer is yes. And we can actually see that trend carry year to year. And so this was actually based on orchard data in Oklahoma. And we've actually repeated this experiment now uh, on an orchard at New Franklin uh, to, to ask, uh, does this trend continue? We don't have the data for that, but for right now, we know that there's clear phytochemi phytochemical differences. There's other statistics that we can bring in because, again, we're working with large numbers of metabolites. And what this is is called a volcano plot, and it tells us more or less the full differences in compounds. And what we see are some compounds that are only in the Kansas variety, and this is the one that's resistant. And the question then becomes, are those the basis or the biochemical basis for resistance to this fungal pathogen. And we can rank those. We can look at fold changes, things like that. And just to reemphasize that there's huge amounts of differences, some of these compounds are over a thousand fold different, higher in our resistant variety as opposed to our susceptible variety. And the list just goes on and on. So again, it's big data. That's why we use the statistical analysis to look at that. 
And so this is just a one blow up of a region that we do see phytochemical differences. This is, this is Kanza uh, up on top, and this is the Pawnee variety here, and those things are different. Now, I commented earlier that um, there's many of these things that we can identify based on their fingerprint. Now, in the plant kingdom, there are hundreds of thousands of different natural products. And so we just don't have the money to build a database of all of those fingerprints. We try to do as much as we can, but often we cannot. And so this is a common challenge in metabolomics, and that is next challenge is chemically, what are those natural products? And because they might be associated with the, uh, the resistant phenomena. And so to do that, we're actually building tools that allow us to do higher throughput metabolite identification. Now, traditionally, the way this was done is somebody went to the field, collected a couple of kilograms or pounds of, of their plant material, they brought it back to the lab, and they started this extensive uh, fractionation process until they got milligrams or grams levels of this material, which they could do the chemical analysis of. And that would take months or, or even years. And there's thousands of dissertations where people have done that. Now, in an omics type of environment, that's just too slow. We need to be faster. So we're trying to develop higher throughput metabolite technologies. And we're doing this from two different directions. One is from a computational approach, and one is from an experimental approach. So I want to talk to you first about the work that Dr. Fong Chu is doing on the computational approach. And more or less, he's taking the data we have, i.e. these metabolic profiles that have been deconvoluted, and he imports them into a custom tool that he's been building. And more or less, once we have that data in there, we begin to search against chemical structural libraries. Now, many of these natural products that we've, we're trying to identify are not known. And so we actually are building predicted metabolomes for these different uh, plant species as well. We search that, and we use that data to ultimately predict a structure that might be associated with this. And so really what we're able to do is to go from, you know, infinite space to a limited number. And you can think of this a lot based on Legos. So we know a lot about phytochemistry, and we know that they make these different scaffolds, the glucosinolates, the flavonoids, ice flavonates. We know that those are often conjugated with sugars, and there are other acyl or other chemical groups that go, sorry if I'm getting too, too technical chemically, but uh, it's, uh, it's what I do and I love it. I have a passion about plant chemistry. But the idea is that these chemicals are Lego blocks, and plants put them together. And we can build a predicted database and search that by just combinatorial enumeration of all of these different Lego blocks. And more or less, we take our mass that we observe, and we measure it against the different co compositions of those Lego blocks, and we use that as a potential identification. But one of the problems we often face still is stereochemistry. And that uh, this molecule has the same mass as that, but it's put together different than that one, and that's called stereochemistry. And in that case, we actually need some empirical tools uh, to differentiate that. But before we jump to that, this is kind of a, a cool annotation that Fong has put together that helps you understand what we're doing. So in our measurements, we're measuring a mass. And then we, here we have all of these different subunits uh, in our library. And more or less, we're doing combinatorial enumeration of that meaning that we're looking at all different possibilities of those different entities that match this specific mass. And so in this process, we're again going from infinite space to a limited number of molecules, and many, often these are stereochemically different. And that's where we have to turn to an empirical tool called NMR. And actually, we have a very sophisticated ensemble of equipment that couples the ultra-high pressure liquid chromatography with mass spectrometry, with a unique collecting, fraction collecting device called solid phase extraction, and then we do nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy on it. So, so this is definitely Toys R Us. Uh, this is, I'm an analytical chemist by training, uh, but it, it works and, and we are solving problems with this. So again, the idea is we have our extracts, we do our profiling. When we see things that are different, uh, we want to purify that compound. And so the way we do that is we set up a, a diversion valve that plumbs that over to one of these solid phase extraction cartridges. Now, the, the problem is, is that this instrument is very sensitive compared to the NMR, which is not very sensitive. So what we have to do is we have to inject this sample over and over and repetitively kept, collect that peak on the same cartridge. We have to do that 10, 20, or 30 times until we get microgram levels of material. Now, the difference is, is this is very automated. 
we can actually automate this process. We can set it up, come back tomorrow, and have enough material for do the NMR analysis. So, and once we have that material uh, on that cartridge, we elute that, uh, and then we take it over to our NMR instrument, our nuclear magnetic re resonance spectrometer. Okay? So this is a fairly automated process that helps us uh, now do the empirical or the experimental chemical identification process. And so that's the way it works. Uh, these are just real pictures of the instruments. This is the uh, UHPLC. This is the mass spectrometer. These are, this is the solid phase extraction unit. This is where we're doing the purification. Uh, we then elute that with a little robot. Uh, we put those into uh, microprobe NMR tubes, and we take it over and get the NMR data. So back to our problem. What is the chemical identity of these? We begin to more or less purify those, and what that means is that we have a chromatogram. We inject that over and over and over again, and we're collecting specific areas of that onto each of those independent speed cartridges. So this is actually purifying one, two, three, four, five, six, seven target compounds in this one type of separation. And so again, it's automated the, automating the purification. We then bring all of this together, um, and we have uh, our traditional LCMS data from our computational tools. We can begin to put together some of the pieces of the puzzles and predict those. We can tell that there are a certain number of sugars on there. We can often tell what the few number of A glycones are, but we can't tell exactly all of the stereochemistry at that point, so we turn to the NMR. And this is one of the tools that we use. It's just a, a spectral analysis that's unique. It tells us a little bit about the stereochemistry. From that, we can tell the specific nature of the A-glycone structure, and this is an example for terpenoids. Uh, and then we do a series of these other NMR spectra, toxies, cozies, nosies, all of these things. And ultimately, what it does is it allows us to put these chemical structures together in a three-dimensional, chemically uh, confident identification type of approach. And so this, it works, um, and we're actually using this to identify uh, the natural products that we are seeing um, in our, our, our um, pecan samples. Now, because yeah, there, there is some potential healthy. intellectual property to those exact identities. Oh, I'm she didn't pick up on that. Exactly I'm, what I'm, they I'm are, but they are polyphenolic <laughs> compounds. Yeah, hold on a second. That, that we, we Billy's need. been trying to call you. All right, yeah. thank you. I, I don't know, maybe he's got the, oh, maybe he's calling the office, just here. So, kind of bringing things uh, to a conclusion, uh, we have developed a, a new metabolomics resource here at the University of Missouri. Uh, it's available to our researchers, uh, but also available to others uh, in the private sector as well. Um, our metabolomics is, is actually clearly showing that there's different phytochemical differences between the resistant and susceptible pecan varieties. Uh, we now have a good idea of what those are. We now need to show that these are antifungal against this specific pathogen. We know that there's information in the literature that they're, uh, they are antifungal against other compounds, but we really need to prove this for this specific pathogen. If so, we've got a home run uh, when we have a phytochemical basis for uh, that uh, type of resistance. And if, as I just said there, uh, once we have that information, we can then begin using that in a selective breeding program uh, to further improve uh, pecan resistance to this uh, pathogen, i.e. bring pathways into, uh, for example, other varieties that are more susceptible to this region, uh, things of that nature. Uh, we can also use these chemicals. We can extract it uh, from maybe nuts and shells, uh, things of that nature, and use those to, as organic fungicides as well. And then finally, uh, just if you're interested, uh, we, uh, uh, we are offering a metabolomics training course. Uh, we've already done one, and really this is to help people better understand the technology that we're developing here. Uh, this will be May 15th through the 19th. This is a one week's hands-on class. Um, it's four days of intensive lab type of analyses. There's a significant number of lectures that explain the theory that goes behind it. And then typically on the Friday, we'll have a symposium uh, uh, that shows uh, the, and illustrates the potential of metabolomics. And uh, there is a cost for this course uh, that is subsidized for those internal to MU, but uh, we do take participants from external entities as well. We allow users to bring their own samples so that ultimately they can get data for their, their own interest and uh, for their focus. 
and then use that uh, to, as hopefully preliminary data that, that can spark and or kick off larger uh, projects and or potential funding applications. So with that, I am doing pretty good on time. Uh, I, I, need, yeah, uh, I need to thank those that, that are funding our, our program, uh, specifically the University of Missouri that is uh, kicking us off here. Um, my former institute, the Noble Foundation, we did a lot of this pecan work, early uh, pecan work there. Uh, we have funding from NSF uh, MRI, which uh, funded our NMR uh, spectrometer. Uh, we have a very close relationship with a company called Bruker Daltonics, which is a mass spec company that is, we've been working with to develop this LCMSB uh, type of NMR approach. And then we had another project that, that's, uh, um, uh, it's not over yet, but it's, uh, it's, it's coming to an end soon but it was there to fund the annotation work, uh, and much of that was done in uh, legumes. So a lot of work, we don't always work in pecan, we actually work in a large number of different plant systems. So if you're interested in, uh, you know, uh, I encourage you to contact us. This is our website. Uh, this is Dr. Lay and his contact information here, and you're welcome to contact uh, uh, either of us if you have any questions. Uh, for our commercial vendors here, um, we do offer external services. Uh, if you want to look at the natu natural product composition of your extracts, your, your ginseng uh, extracts, your elderberry extracts, things of that nature, we'd love to talk with you uh, about that. And if you want you know, to evaluate quality, these are all things uh, that we can do. So with that, thank you for your attention, uh, and I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you, Lloyd. Um, my apologies to the speaker and the audience for uh, that. Had some audio wires crossed there. Um, we have a, f uh, a few minutes for a few questions. Um, Hi. So, sorry. I, I um, again because we're in the Monsanto auditorium and because these instruments are so bloody expensive, I feel like I have to ask you this, but you, you'll identify a compound, you, it sounds like you have identified a compound or a small number of compounds probably present at very low levels responsible for um, uh, phytoprotective, let's say, in the Kwanzaa, Kwanzaa variety. Um, a, f a chemical company um, could make a lot of money taking that compound, although it's a natural product, but probably just a minor derivatization or a minor modification, and it could become uh, a hot pesticide. Um, could you just comment a little bit about, uh, about the intellectual property and financial entanglements of doing this sort of work? It's actually a good question. Uh, I, you know, I'm not an expert at IP uh, and or that. But one of the powers of our metabolomics platform is that it identifies a large number of components. And many of these are more or less chemical derivatives of similar compounds. So we're getting a lot of information about that biochemical diversity there and how that might be exploited for uh, uh, fungicide type of applications. Now, when we go to do the fungicide, you know, the um, growth inhibition assays with these, and we can actually do it uh, for many of these compounds. Many of them are commercially available. We can just buy it and do it that way. Uh, our our LCMSB can also be a source for purifying those to do that. So specifically to answer your question, there's already chemical diversity in the plant. And we're hoping that that will be informative about the breadth of chemical diversity that might be there and how that might affect an IP application. Now, there's always going to be a, a, you know, a super sharp organic chemist somewhere that, that might be able to make it better. Uh, but, uh, um, you know, in the end, it both helps the, the local growers, right? So. We have time for perhaps one more question. Uh, on uh, the chemistry in plants, I've I've been reading about how plants manufacture chemicals over their lifespan, and so things will change. <laughs> how do you, uh, if, if you say this one pecan has resistance at that point, but there are other interactions happening in the soil and the mycorrhizal associations with 
when insects bite a leaf, that sends a cascade of chemistry that it's absolutely changes, true. changes the situation. So how do you correct for that? There, there's two types of phytochemical-based resistance. One is called phytoalexins, which are induced in response to a stress, and there are other are called phytoanticipins that are there at some constitutive level all the time. Always. And so that's why we were doing the year-to-year -year study. That's why we looked at multiple trees. That's why we're trying to reproduce that here. The, the trends are clear that these, many of these are conserved. Now, if you can, you know, if you go out and beat your tree, I mean, just take a whip out to it, odds are you can induce these a little bit further. But uh, we first have to have that, this is a discovery platform. And our discovery events are these metabolites may be the basis of, of, of resistance. Then you follow up with more hypo hypothesis-driven research that says, okay, when and why are these, are they're, they're there, uh, how are they induced through environmental parameters? We know that environmental parameters do affect them, and is that or is that not uh, important to uh, the disease resistance? So, so it's job security. 